Leo is 50 years younger and I kick your ass. My fans can be the harshest critics, you know. And they often are. A wife is often the harshest critic <laughs> of her husband. <laughs> I thought I was invincible. That's what you're, you're trained to believe as a sports person. There was four million people in Ireland who knew much more about managing <laughs> football teams than I did. When it comes to music, I can spoof for the best. Your sporting career is the best time you'll have, and, you know, you have to hang on to it for as long as your life, because everything else is pretty crappy. And this is not like Stephen Rochford has never spoken to Jimmy McGinnis in his life. All right, you're welcome along to this Saturday's Saturday panel. Neil Tracy here with you uh, for the moment. And we are looking at sports photography uh, is what we're going to look at over the course of the next hour or so. We are currently streaming live across all of our social platforms on OTB Sports Radio as well. You can watch this on video if you want on our YouTube channel at Off The Ball and across Twitter and Facebook as well. Worth looking back, if you are listening on the radio, worth looking back on the video a little bit later on because we are going to be running through a couple of great examples of uh, the sports fo uh, sports photography that's been supplied to us over uh, over uh, the last day or so by our two guests today who are going to be Brendan Moran and Stephen McCarthy, both staff photographers with Sportsfile, uh, one of Ireland's biggest sports pho uh, photographic agencies. So uh, watch back on the video as well. We'll also put a link up online where you can look back at some of these photos just so... There's a bit of cross-platform relevance here as well for those of you listening on the, on the radio. We'll try and talk you through some of these photos as well. Uh, Brendan Moran is on the line with me at the moment. Brendan, good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon, Neil. Um, so as we were talking about in our news around there, Brendan, a little bit earlier on, we're probably in the new normal situation. What is life for you at the moment? How are you coping with the, the, current, the current climate? Well, we're, we're still trying to uh, keep the show on the road. Um, We've been out a couple of days during the week trying to do, you know, members of the public taking part and stuff, or we're trying to look for features, or we're, we're still trying to keep something on the road. Like my colleague, um, Sam Barnes, had a, had, he did uh, kite surfers the other day uh, over in Dollymount Strand, and he was on the front page of the Irish Independent. So we're trying to keep it going. We're doing racing today, obviously, in Thurless. We've been doing racing during the week, and sure, as long as that's going, we'll probably keep continuing to go to it. There's going to be, there's going to be a lot of racing photography done over the next while, isn't there? Yeah, it's going to be difficult to uh, to try and come up with something fresh, but that's the challenge. You know, we have to try and uh, keep the show on the road in any way we can because obviously with sport pretty much postponed all around the world, it's uh, it's a difficult time as it is for sports journalists. And look, in fairness, I suppose we're not the uh, one of the most important people in the world, like between the health staff and the frontline staff there, keeping the, the food supplies going. You know, we're somewhat irrelevant to all them, but it's, we're trying to keep it going anyway. Yeah, as you say, the kind of context is key. Um, there are a lot of people around the world at the moment who have far more things to be worrying about than sport being cancelled. Stephen McCarthy, your colleague, is now there with us as well. Stephen, afternoon. I was just, uh, I was just asking Brendan there, what does a sports pho photographer do when there's very little sport to photograph? I think we're getting pretty desperate now. Uh, at this stage, we're uh, wandering around the Phoenix Park and we're just to try to find anybody kicking a ball or... Uh, are doing anything at this stage um look all our guys are still working hard they're all trying to come up with ideas of different things and um we'll keep it going we'll keep trying to find different ideas and different angles on sport uh i suppose we're in a way we're quite thankful that the racing is still go ahead to to uh to keep us uh, keep us going but look i think it's inevitable as well in in, time, in the next couple of weeks we may see no sport whatsoever um but uh but we'll keep trying in a way as long as we have that opportunity in terms of your own both of your own personal situations. Have you been cooped up at home for the last while? Have you families to families to keep entertained? Uh, I don't no. think there's going to be any kids <laughs> wandering in the background of either <laughs> of no, these uh, the shots not. today. Unlike Tommy there recently, but um, well, I like as I said you, you have to get out. You have to get out even just for your mental health. Do you know what I mean? The weather's decent, so if it's if it's going out for a walk or if it's going out for a cycle or whatever, while it might be. Single, I know that there's some people like challenging, challenging each other just to like do, you know, 10K or 5K and compare times with other people, you know, your friends or whatever. So even that's like a bit of a goal because it is, you can get cooped up fairly quick, but we'll, we'll keep going anyway. And do you take a small little camera with you if you're going out for an old walk? Uh, you always have a camera with you, you know, like <laughs> yeah. even if it's the phone, like it, it there's, there's pictures everywhere. Every single day there's pictures, even if... Even if there's nobody outdoors, there's pictures to be had. So it's really just a question of finding them and 
keeping your eyes open, really. That's what we do as photographers, keep our eyes open the whole time. So, guys, um, a bit about yourselves, you might maybe kind of, for those who aren't familiar with your work or who you are, you might explain who you are, how you got involved in this industry. Uh, Stephen, if we can start with you, a little bit of background about yourself. Uh, yeah, so I started uh, in 20, uh, or sorry, 2007, a uh, long time ago now. Um, as uh, I just, I'm from Kerry originally, um, went and done a bit of work experience when I was still in secondary school, uh, went for a, for a week and I absolutely loved it. So the opportunity came up then to come back for the summer. So once I got that into my head and uh, I was so thankful at the time that you know, we, had, we had a very good boss who just gave people opportunities and Ray McManus and he says, look, if you're doing nothing for the summer, come back. And once I heard that, that's it. And that was my goal. So I uh, went back, finished my leaving cert. Uh, and I, the following day, I was on the train to Dublin. So I'm from Kerry originally. I said so. It's a, it was it was a big move for me at the time. And I just, but I knew what I wanted to do, and this was my goal. Um, and I just took at it and just done every job possible, from cleaning the floors, from working on the picture desk, and then in my days off and my time off, that I'd go out and take pictures. And then you just keep working away at it and learning from who are probably some of the best sports photographers uh, in 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 Europe and even some even in the world uh, that work with sports files. So. It was the best place to learn uh, the trade. What I is what I felt. So from then, 2007 onwards, it's just been on an upward curve, and it's uh, it's been a pleasure to be part of of, of an agency like Sportsfile. So when you went when you went in as a teenager doing the work experience initially, did you have an idea that this was something you'd actually like to do, or was it a case where once you actually got in there, you kind of saw all this happening and you went, oh my god, I I absolutely love this. I, I had an idea beforehand. So I was uh, I was involved with same areas GA club in Carsevine, and uh, for years I was the the PRO, and I was this, that, and the other thing there. And I used to do a couple of pictures and write match reports and stuff like that. And I remember seeing the satisfaction that like from uh, let's say under twelves, under tens, like that we're getting from seeing their name in the newspaper. Um, I think at the time the Kerryman uh, notes were had to be extended because there were so many match reports put in from same areas. But I just <laughs> felt that from the satisfaction from an under 10 or under 12 player was probably greater than what a senior player was going to get out of it. So I, I loved that side of it and I loved the media element of it. So, But then I started taking pictures and I thought, hold on, this is a lot easier than writing all these match reports. <laughs> um, so I suppose that's where I got my first taste of it. And then getting a picture published is great. And you'd, I'd still be in school and I'd be buying the, the newspapers on a Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, all the local newspapers to see, did we get a picture used? And then the satisfaction of that was incredible, the buzz out of it. Um, so from there, that's probably where I came from. And I once I got a taste for it, I said, this is what I want to do and just had to find my way into it. Um, and thankfully, I got that opportunity with Sportsfall. And Brendan, your own story. Are, are you a Kerry man as well? Yeah, I yeah, am. Yeah. All the grades come from Kerry. You see, you're saying? you're uh, so, you're so used to just looking at <laughs> photographs of all Ireland's being lifted. It was just a, a nice way for you to go. Yeah, um, it, it, like my my story is somewhat similar in 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 ways, but I come from a totally different era to Stephen. In that back when I started, like we were using film and prints and things like that. Like there was none of this. Like have a picture up in two minutes. But again, some of my route would have been the same in that I would have worked for the local papers in Kerry when I was a teenager. And I just had this great buzz because like, my dad would have been a, a steward in the local GA ground. So from going to games and being interested in Kerry football and all that, I wasn't very good at football. So the next best thing to get near the field was take a camera. Um, so I would have done that for a couple of years uh, in my teenage years up to my leaving cert. And again, like Stephen, came up to Ray uh, McManus in sports file asked him for a job. He was like, mm, we'll see, whatever. And I'm there ever since, and that's now 26 years ago. Oh my God. So they put up with me for that long. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, like, what I'm picking up from the 2E, would this be a case for a lot of people where the the love of sport was there initially for, for most photographers, and slowly they, you know, they find the photography as the vocation after that? Or would there be many people who just absolutely adore photography and found their way into sport afterwards? Uh, yeah, um, definitely. I think I would be from that side of it. I suppose maybe, maybe Brendan has a different background uh, in terms of that, but I would. I suppose my first love was sport, and then I found the photography element afterwards. Um, and we, I suppose we're, we're both from and Kerry. I suppose everything revolves around sport. It is the the basis of the community. So we've been brought up with that first, and the, then maybe he would, Brendan might have taken a different direction towards photography, whereas I kind of stumbled across it initially. Yeah, like I'd have to say the love of sport was definitely a driver in it. Uh, the photography looked like a cool way of getting into it. And, and mm. I said, near being pit side and things like that, because 
with photography, you have to be on the front line. You can't be up on the stand looking at replays or what did your man say there? You know, there's none of that. You have to be right there. And nothing can be between you and the subject. So that's that was probably uh, getting as close to the pitch as I could get. Um, whereas, uh, you know, I think if, if, if you like photography and get into sport, I think uh, that's a little bit more difficult. I think if you love the sport, and again, like a lot of the lads that have come through our business in the last 30 or 40 years, um, wouldn't necessarily... They would have had the love of sport first. And while, yes, you could love photography, the the technicalities of photography have changed an awful lot in my era um, since I started. So you have to learn as you go. You can never kind of stand still in terms of photography and the technicalities, how you learn. Uh, you have to keep improving. You have to keep learning. There's always new technology coming out. You know, like when I started, there was hardly the internet. And look at us now. I would uh, actually. I would imagine you absolutely would have to adore sport because going out to games and stuff. I would see, you know, we'd be going into our nice sheltered press boxes and stuff like that, where we have little desks for ourselves. We would see ye getting ready, and it could be in the the depths of winter, and you have four or five layers of waterproof gear on, and you're waddling around like this. You've so much clothes on. You'd have to absolutely love it. I'd say to be sitting out on the pitch in flogging rain, freezing cold just waiting for the right moment to get the perfect picture. I think definitely think that is the case, all right. Um, but I think a lot of that comes down to what attitude you bring to it as well. Like, you can see the weather as, oh, it's, this is a nightmare, but why am I going out to do this? Or you can see it as, well, okay, if it's lashing rain, this is probably going to produce some great pictures today. So yeah. I often think it's all down to the attitude you bring to it, no matter what what, what the event is. Um, like, the, the recently we're looking forward to the start of the League of Ireland season, an opening day, then you're, or just the opening weekend, you've got Bows and Rovers, and it's pouring rain, it's cold, it's muddy pitch, and people are saying, oh, geez, it must be a nightmare to be working that, but you know what, it actually produced great pictures because the torn up pitch and everything just adds to the yeah. whole atmosphere of it. So I think you, it, it's all about the, atm the, the attitude you bring to it as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with Stephen there in that the, the condition might be bad, but the worst the conditions are you sometimes think there's going to be a picture in this. Now, yeah. there's a bit of luck in that whether you get it or not, but you work hard to get it because there's nothing worse than being out there whether it's wet or soaked or whatever and coming back with nothing. So if the weather's bad, th there's an even greater challenge because you really want to come back with something outstanding and something that really shows the conditions. And, you know, yeah, you don't really think about the weather. It's, you know, you're trying to get the picture. That's at the end of the day. You're trying to get... I want to show people what the conditions are really like. It's different seeing it maybe on television or reading it in reports or on the radio, but we really want to sh show the people what it's like. On a particularly bad day like that, though, have, have there ever been a moment kind of down in your careers where you have taken what initially you thought was just this absolutely perfect snap, it's getting all the weather together, and then, like, is the rain kind of catching the lens and stuff like that that's absolutely ruined it for you? Yeah, there is definitely those days, I think, especially when you have two photographers at a game. Uh, you, you, you get the situation where one person's going to have the rain at their back and the other person's going to have it going into the lens. So there is definitely days like that. And you just often it's a toss of a coin or something like that. But then you just got to remain positive and hopefully that the lens will be dry for that moment where the, where the action comes towards you. Yeah, sometimes it can add to the picture. Do you know what I mean? If there's rain on the lens, like obviously you do your best with whether you have clots or whatever to keep the lens dry. Um, but but at the end of the day, you're there to get a picture. So whether it's come hell or high water, as they say, we're there to get the best picture. And the weather is kind of, it's a story for afterwards. Or it's, yeah, you're driving home and you're wet and your socks are wet and your pants are wet or whatever. Uh, you don't really worry about that at the time. You're out there to get the best picture. And I think that's what drives us all. It's, it's, it's recording the history. Like, there'll be plenty of news photographers and sports photographers out over the next while trying to record the thing. Not as much for the papers, but as for historic. Like, this is a truly historical time in, in Irish history at the moment uh, with this outbreak. So, you know, photographers are there as well to ca capture history. So we kind of, a lot of the obstacles we put behind us until we all meet up and we all chat about it and give out about it. But when we're out taking the pictures, that's all we care about. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I would say... Uh we're going to run through some examples of uh, your work. You were kind enough to send us in a few photos. We'll do that later on uh, in this chat. But first of all, would some sports be more photogenic than others? I would kind of have my this idea in my head that things like rugby and hurling 
they they always just seem to make for great photography because they're so kind of confrontational. There's always players coming together, whereas maybe something like soccer, there's a lot more space on the pitch where it's just a player with a ball at his feet and there isn't as much happening. Would would that be right? Uh, yeah, yeah definitely. I, uh, I think it, there would be. Um, I suppose if you, you'd be looking at uh, hurling is often known as uh, it would be a very picturesque sport, I suppose. Um, rugby then ha- has has definitely got its moments, but then sports have changed over the years. Like the, the running rugby, you don't get it in every game. Um, the celebrations might be better in football and soccer and stuff like that. So there is, uh, I think, different uh, different sports do produce different pictures, um, and some would be better than others. Uh, but then I think that every day you go to a match, there's probably a picture to be had. But yeah, definitely hurling, I suppose, is, we're, we're probably privileged to have a sport like that uh, in Ireland um, that we can that we can photograph so regularly as well to produce some excellent. Yeah, I'd agree with Stephen there. Uh, hurling would be definitely the number one sport. Like, the faster the sport, the, the better pictures you can nearly get at it. Like, I would consider boxing one of the hardest for, sports to photograph. While I don't do it a lot, like Stephen would have been at the Mayweather McGregor fight a number of years back. And again, there's a lot of photographers ringside and there's a lot of pictures taken at it, but he just had an outstanding image out of it in that he had the two, two of them boxing, basically each other. And then you had in the background, there was a little banner that said McGregor v Mayweather. And it, it just, all the elements came together. But as I said, boxing and hurling are particularly two of the hardest because with boxing, you nearly, and with hurling to an extent, you nearly have to be predicting what's going to happen before it actually happens. So it's that, while we mightn't be physically fit, we have to be mentally fit to to um, be able to anticipate what's going to happen because if you blink and you miss it, we don't have replays. We just got to get it before it happens. So when so when you hang up the hang up the camera someday, are you going to go go down into some kind of like coaching consultancy role? You you can you can read the sports now better than the coaches can themselves. You know exactly where players are going to move, when they're going to move. Ah, oh, jeez, I, 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 I don't know about that now. Like, players do all the training. We just sit at the side of the pitch. Um, I don't know about that. But that's, like, like a lot of a lot of the best sports photographers' uh, knowledge would be important mm. of what's going on. There's, there's nothing worse than turning up to a sport that you don't know anything about. If you don't know where to start and you don't know where the best pictures are going to be, and then it could be over before you even started. So you got to know what's going on. That's That's one of the keys. Yeah, I definitely think there's an element of that in boxing as well. Like if you think of the the boxer in the ring, on the other end of the punch, doesn't know it's coming, and he's been training all his life for it. And <laughs> you, you're standing on the apron, and you mightn't have done boxing for twelve months or something like that, and you're trying to predict when the punch is coming. So there's often an element of maybe overshooting uh, boxing because you just don't know when it's coming. And, and the same with, with with football as well. When a fellow's running down the wing, generally you're actually looking in the box for the movement of the players before you're not looking at the uh, the player running down the wing or waiting to cross because. If you're waiting for him to cross it, and then you're trying to figure out who's going to head it in or who's going to tap it in, you're probably going to be that bit slower. So, like these guys are playing football every day of the week, you're doing football maybe twice, three times a week, or something like that. So, I think there is definitely knowledge in it, and then trying to predict things as well. And then I suppose there's that huge, uh, huge element of luck involved in these things as well. As you say, like you know, there are some sports that are more more photogenic and more enjoyable to photo than others. Have there been individuals you've spotted down in the down in the career that always just seem to always just seem to throw up the right the right facial expression like I think the one that always gets shared around is like the Phil Jones face from Manchester United he always just seems to has, have this kind of this gurning expression on his face are, are there uh, athletes you would have kind of noticed down the years that they just always seem to be kind of this confrontational look about them that they always just make for make for a better shot or are there some people that kind of have the, the deadpan expression even when they're running at full tilt uh, I think that's the, like some players do. Some players like it depends on their personality a lot of the time. Some players are just like uh, introvert, so yeah. they like it doesn't matter whether they win or lose. They're kind of going, "Oh yeah, lovely, that's grand." Whereas there are other people, and they're far more emotional. Like David Fitzgerald would be obvious, an obvious example. Like when he's on the sideline, you nearly have to watch him as much as you have to watch the match <laughs> because he's just giving it everything that he has. Like, I suppose to an extent, Jurgen Klopp would be quite similar in that he does a lot of celebrating and he a lot of expressions. And, and even back in the days of Giovanni Trapattoni when he was the Republic of Ireland manager, every time you went to a press conference with him, you were just going, this is just like filling me boots. You know, there was pictures everywhere, hands and everywhere. That, and, that's a, and that's a press conference even, like. 
Yeah, and at some stages he was actually getting up and trying to explain it in English, but with throwing in a German word and an Italian word, and he'd get up and he'd be pretending to kick a ball, and you're kind of going, never seen a press conference like this. <laughs> so there, it, it certainly depends on the personality. Some people are very good at it. Some people are quite reserved. And even in professional sport, there are a lot of, I suppose there are a lot of, of players that kind of go, they're so tuned into the game and they're going, OK, we won, that's grand, we're on to the next game, we're on to the next game. And that's the way it's gone. So you probably don't have as many characters as you would add in the, the good old days, shall I call it. Um, but yeah, yeah, it definitely depends on the personality. Yeah, I definitely think there is a, the one that comes to mind straight away is I think any of the Waterford hurlers <laughs> during that time. <laughs> like you, you had great times with John Milan, and I suppose it helped that they didn't have the helmets at the time. Um, so they were great to photograph, and then the Shanahans as well. You had Dan and Ish, and then Morris was great in the later years. Uh, and then you throw those Davy into the mix of that, and then well, that's that's some combination. Um, but uh, I think they were they were the ones that always came came to mind. I suppose. Um, like then you you would let, let's say photographing Katie Taylor over the last number of years, she wouldn't have been showing much emotion. But I think it's been changing recently. I think the bigger the fights, she lets herself go and uh, on this on the the decisions and the announcements. Um, so there's like she she's so reserved all during the week and fight week and everything like that. Um, and then she just there's that moment at the end of the fight where she lets herself go. You just got to be ready for that. So um, that's knowing your sport as well as to which uh, which athletes are going to react and uh, who, uh, at what times. Yeah, as I say, we're going to run through some of the the great pictures that Stephen and Brendan have sent us on uh, yesterday. Coming up after the break, first though, we're just going to take a quick little break and more from our sports photography panel coming up in a few minutes. Saturday panel on Off the Ball. Jennifer from Kinsale writes, I arrived at yours with such excitement. You looked and smelled phenomenal. We drove to the beach, found a secluded spot, and then, after five minutes, you were all gone. Your two juicy patties, crisp lettuce, onions, cheese, and Big Mac sauce finished. Good news, Jennifer. You can now spend even longer with the taste you love with the Grand Big Mac but only until the 24th of March, because nothing lasts forever. Lawn moss, not a problem. Apply zero lawn liquid now in your lawn. I'm Porry Corkin, garden expert on Pat Kenny's programme, and I use zero lawn liquid on my own lawn. Zero kills moss overnight, zero is easy to apply and very fast acting. Apply zero to your lawn now for a moss-free, rich green lawn this spring. Zero Lawn Liquid is now available online at horkins.ie for a direct delivery to your home. For a moss-free lawn this spring, apply Zero Lawn Liquid now. With Virgin Mobile, there's nothing hidden. Now you can try unlimited 4G data, calls and texts for only €15 Euro a month for 12 months. All on a 30-day contract. And better yet, everyone can try it. It's an offer that's bigger than big. See virginmobile.ie. Virgin Mobile. Nothing hidden. Fair usage and T's and C's apply. €25 Euro a month after offer ends 3rd of June 2020. Simple ways to surprise your mum on Mother's Day. Making her breakfast in bed at 6am. Happy Mother's Day! Oh. Presenting her with a great big gift. Open it. Another Hoover. Thanks. Serving her a heartwarming dinner that she made. Delicious. Or give her the chance to win up to 50,000 euro instantly with the new extended play range of scratch cards. Yes! From the National Lottery. Now with even more chances to win. Pick them up in store today and surprise your mum this Mother's Day. Play responsibly, play for fun. At home base, get a large pack of Westland 90 litre compost or bark chippings for only €6.45. Euros 45. Home base feels good to be home. Whilst stops last, terms at homebase.co.uk. We'll wait for the bus, the train, or the lights to turn green. We'll wait for the weekend and we'll wait for the rain to stop. But when it comes to pain, nobody wants to wait. That's why Neurofen Rapid Relief Liquid Capsules start working in just seven minutes with a formula that's absorbed faster than standard ibuprofen tablets. Choose Neurofen Rapid Relief Liquid Capsules and unleash the speed of liquid. Neurofen Rapid Relief Maximum Strength 400 milligram liquid capsules contain ibuprofen. For mild to moderate pain, always read the label. An important message for all public transport passengers to protect yourself, operating staff and others from COVID-19 when travelling by bus, tram and train. Thanks to our hardworking staff, Transport for Ireland services are operating. Schedules may change, so check operator websites and transportforireland.ie for regular updates. Please also consider if your journey is necessary. 
If you have any sort of fever or cough, you should stay at home. Follow the recommended hygiene advice from the health authorities, particularly regarding hand washing, coughing and sneezing in public. Try to pay with contactless TFI Leap cards instead of cash and maintain social distancing. We thank you for your cooperation and wish you the best of health now and always. On 106 to 108 FM, on Newstalk.com, on Smart Speaker and on the Newstalk app. This, this is Newstalk. It's two o'clock. I'm Stephen Murphy. The health minister is meeting medical leaders this afternoon to discuss Ireland's response to COVID-19. There have been 683 confirmed cases in the Republic so far, with 126 people testing positive yesterday. Simon Harris says political and medical leaders must be united to tackle the spread of the virus. He's also urging people to practice social distancing if they're out this weekend. This is a tough and challenging time for all of us. The only way we're going to get through it is if we pull together. So we've got to keep our physical distance, absolutely. But that doesn't mean we can't be helpful to each other. The Department of Finance says it's considering options whereby employers can top up the incomes of employees who've been temporarily laid off due to coronavirus. Hundreds of thousands of workers have so far been let go in sectors like retail and hospitality as businesses shut indefinitely. The government's confirmed it will allow employers to pay more than the €203 Euro a week support being made available. Fianna Fáil's finance spokesperson Michael McGrath says the measure doesn't go far enough. It's not tenable that people be expected to survive on €203 Euro per week while waiting an unknown number of weeks even for a basic top-up for child dependents and adult dependents. Police in the north say they've received reports of antisocial behaviour and end-of-school parties despite social distancing advice. Officers in Carrickfergus, County Antrim, had to disperse a group of 300 teenagers last night who'd met up for a party. The PSNI say the coronavirus pandemic is not a movie and that the situation will only get more serious every day. Finally, a nursing home in County Cork is appealing to young people to write to its residents. Due to the coronavirus outbreak. Visitor restrictions have been, in pla- have been put in place at St Luke's Nursing Home in Mahan. On the first day of the initiative, 200 letters and 100 emails were received from school children. Activities manager at St Luke's, Lisa Howard, says they're delighted by the response and that there's a good system in place to handle the mail. We put together a group um, of residents who are going to look after this scheme for us. They're going to be um, the postal service team. <laughs> so we're after making a big massive post box centre in the home um, for all 100 28 residents and then these five particular residents are going to look after the post as it comes in and divide the letters into each pigeonhole for each resident so everybody will be getting posts from um, children all over the country That's it for now, there's more at three News Talk Weather Thanks to the AA Download the new AA app to request a roadside rescue and track the patrol right to your car It'll be dry and cloudy today with a few sunny spells, feeling cool with highest temperatures 5 to 8 degrees. And now you're up to date on Newstalk. Off the ball. This This is Newstalk. All right, you're very welcome back to Off the Ball this Saturday. Neil Tracy here with you on the Saturday panel. John Duggan will be back a little bit later on between 3 and 4 o'clock. We'll be starting our new new series, World Cup Revisited. Looking back on, uh, we're going to pick a World Cup every week. This week it's going to be Spain 1982. Dan McDonnell and Johnny Ward will be joining us for that as well. And they'll be staying on between 4 and 5 to discuss some of the big, uh, big issues from the world of football this week. There are plenty of stories coming out so uh, we'll be streaming all of that between three and five o'clock at the moment on our Saturday panel we're talking sports photography with uh, two uh, two members of sports file Brendan Moran and Stephen McCarthy are with me get your texts into us now on 53106 guys you kind of mentioned it there earlier on how like you know you'd have different roles when when you're out at games and there'd be multiple photographers there how you're saying in windy rain or something you know someone might have the rain to their back and someone's looking into it how many, on, on, a given, on a given day for a big event, I'm talking All-Ireland final, a big Six Nations game, a, a World Cup qualifier for the Republic of Ireland, how many, how many photographers from even just one agency, from Sports File, for example, are going to be there? And I would imagine you all have very different roles of what you're looking for. Um, yeah, it, it, the, there'd been an element of planning in that as well. Um, in that it would depend on the qualifier. Now, if it was Six Nations, it might be three people. If it's Republic of Ireland, it might be five people. But in all Ireland final, it could be eight or nine photographers. Um, and a lot of that's down to the volume of uh, commercial work that we end up doing. 
Uh, I mean, that, you know, we would do a lot of work for governing bodies, whether it's the GAA or Leinster Rugby or the FAI or whoever. So they'd have a lot of needs as well on a particular day. Um, like they might, everything from mascots to corporate box work to, you know, uh, there's so many things going on with it, to be honest with mm. you. Mini games at halftime, um, like there'd be exclusive things then from members of, say, the Vantage Club or the Blue Room for Leinster or whatever. So we'd, we'd have boots on the ground, in fairness, uh, for the likes of that work. Um, the match itself, the match is played and, and we get what we can. Um, but we would try and think of every eventuality where we can as well and prepare. And basically our job is not to miss anything. So would it, yeah, be, a si would it be a situation yeah, maybe where, like, Brendan, you're told, you know, are you looking out for a specific player or a, a certain part of the pitch? And Stephen, you might be told you're looking out for, for something a little bit different. Uh, I think, uh, let's say, Null Iron Final is probably the best example of it because that would be our showpiece event of the year as well. Um, as much as every other event that goes on, is we give it our all and it's we, we treat them with, uh, with, with all the staff that we can put on them. But when it comes to that game... I suppose that's our it's the biggest event I suppose in the, the Irish sporting calendar so we would classify that as a, as a as a number one um target for us to showcase our our abilities and uh, us as an agency so when it would come to that game Brendan touched on eight, maybe 8 or 9 it's probably 10 or 11 it's gone to these days uh, for uh, sports while photographers working on a game like that and we would target let's say different elements of the pitch so if you have you number one you cover your four corners and then you'd you start working in different positions um so you might have somebody up in the stand you'd have a number somebody else maybe on just solely focusing on managers for reactions and stuff like that and then you have people in close to the goal you have people up the sideline so we'd when it would all be planned out well in advance that everybody knew where they were going and what their role was on the day in terms of targeting specific players it's not as, as straightforward as that i suppose you you, you it, it depends where the action happens like at the end of an All Ireland final, you would always be maybe hoping that the, the the star player or the player who scored the winning goal or the winning point lands in your in your patch. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, even with Henry Shefflin's last game with Kilkenny, that no matter what happened, that's the picture you needed. He's his hands raised in 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 the in the in the air at the final whistle, and I think he landed actually in the middle of the pitch. So he was actually close to nobody, but everybody had a picture at an angle on it. Um, but uh, th I suppose that's what we would be looking at. That's the roles on the day. And then obviously it filters down to the other uh, um, work, like Brenda mentioned, the commercial work and stuff like that. But like we want to have the big moment, the, the, the moment that won the game, um, no matter what it is. And that's why we probably have so many staff as well. Is there a particular role on, on a given day or is there a particular area of the pitch that you always just kind of prefer being in that you feel you kind of get the, the best action in? I think no, Brendan I think and I, I both would know where that is in Crow Park. <laughs> yeah, well, I think there's 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 an element that you, you you work as a team, so it's like the team on the pitch. There would be people strong at certain things, and the people mightn't be as strong in other on other parts of the game. Um, like while the game lasts thirty five minutes a half or forty and a half, we're we've every minute of the day essentially planned out. Mm. So there's even like we'd even plan out the time for lunch. Uh, you know, to, to get a sandwich in Crow Park and whatever. But you would you would peop, use people to their their skills. So people that are certain good at certain things, like I wouldn't be the fittest man going around, so I'm not going to be running around necessarily after the managers <laughs> with a wide angle. Whereas I leave that to Stephen. He's far fitter than me. So so like, but but then again, my experience would be different to some of the younger guys in our place. So I can be left to my own devices and I'll sniff out a picture or I'll see something or I'll react to something. Um, so a lot of it is, is it's essentially, as I said, like a team event. So you've got like your forwards, your backs and whatever. You've just got people that are good at, at their job. Now, we would all be good at action, but then there's some people like dealing with clients, some people like, you know, taking the mascots, some people are good with, you know, there's a, a myriad of things that we end up doing on a match day, but you try and get people that are, um, like I wouldn't be very good at maybe photographing fans' pictures, but then there are colleagues of mine that are very good at it. So there's no point me doing it, but we'd rather put the strong guy or the strong photographer on, on, on doing creative fan pictures. So, you know, it's, it's, it's trying to utilize people to their best, their, their abilities and the best abilities that they have. So that's kind of how we would approach it. I presume as well, you have to be quite bullish, particularly in the kind of the moments after a big final, when you're out on the pitch, getting ready for a trophy presentation that you probably have to push your way up as much as you can to the front to get that perfect shot 
right in front of a trophy presentation. Yeah, there's definitely an element to that, isn't there? That uh, I suppose when you're six foot something, uh, take no prisoners. It, it, it definitely helps as well um, to get to getting your getting the picture you need. But I think there's also look, you can be smart in those situations as well. You don't have to be so aggressive as well. There is foot will take they take the, the aggressive route as well. But I think if you're smart, uh, you know where where to be at the right time, and you know how to get the picture. And uh, there's an element as well have to be uh, of working with with your colleagues as well um, and rivals around you that you don't you don't put on a show. Remember. Like we have to remember that we're we're on show as well. There's television cameras everywhere, so you don't want to be seen um, running around and, um, aimlessly and uh, and so aggressively as well. But uh, th- look, we all have a picture to get. We all have a job to do. So there is uh, we, we do um, we do have to get ourselves in the right place at the right time for for those big moments. And after those big finals, obviously, it's great to be taking the pictures of the guys that are celebrating. I think oftentimes some of the best photos come from the complete dejection when. You know, there's someone completely alone in a stadium that's full of people. Uh, one thing I've wondered, have you ever taken a picture like that and you've, you've caught a moment that is just pure dejection? It's someone at an incredibly vulnerable moment and they're incredibly emotional. Have you ever taken that and put it out there and maybe afterwards felt a little guilty that, you know, it, it might be a little bit invasive or something that you might have maybe caught them at too kind of too emotional a moment? Obviously, we, neither of us want to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, well, I think in fairness, um, at the bigger events, I think the players understand once they're on the pitch, they're seen by the public, they're seen by television, they're seen by photographers, they're seen by everybody. So I think there's an element of acceptance to that. Yeah. Um, obviously, when they're in their dressing room by themselves after a match and they're dejected, nobody goes in. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But, um, yeah, like it's it's... Sport is 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 part of human, you know, human existence. So there is there is the ups and there is the downs. Now you're not going in there to be invasive, but you're trying to, I suppose, show people to understand how how much it meant to the player in question, whether it's they're crying or they've their head down or whatever it is. You're trying to, you're not trying to exploit the moment, but you're trying to get people to understand that this meant so much to this player, and they're just devastated by it and then I think people become empathetic with it and they kind of, well, yeah, it's not all about winning. You know, people have, there has to be a loser at the end of the day. And it's, it's, I suppose it's showing both sides of like the, the celebration, but also that look, there are equally, the other team could have potentially won the game as well. And they might be on the other side of the coin. So sport has very fine margins, but um, yeah, I've taken pictures like that. And, and, while it might be difficult at the time, and you would have empathy for the people, yeah. invariably they would come back to you later on in life and go, "Yeah, Jesus, that's," I, you know, they think back to their picture and they 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 might look at it and they go, "Yeah, well, look, I was it was tough at the time, but now I appreciate it for what it is." Like we've had a letter from, I remember one of the early days of season Sundays. Um, one of the players got a picture. Uh, Jarlett Burns got a picture of himself. He got the book. And there was a picture of himself after winning, beaten down for the first time in I don't know how long. They won Ulster f- for the first time in a long time. But he wrote a letter to us and he explained that when he got the book at Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, he actually went out training again so that he would replicate, try and replicate that feeling of joy. You know what I mean? So there, there's mm. there's both sides to it that I think, I think in fairness, once we're not too invasive to them, that we give them a bit of space, I think generally players are fine with it. And yeah, I'm, there is, and I, it, there, like, we're, we're there in the good days and the bad days, unfortunately. Uh, but then I think often players will use it, uh, as Brenda said, uh, the, the way that Charlotte used it there is to to motivate themselves. And if and if they see that picture, say, well, I don't want to feel like that again. Um, and there, maybe there's there's an element of that. Or often you take a picture and you say, I really don't want to put this out, but I know it's my job and it's it's part of the event that I've I've been here to cover. And you, you'd be you'd be slow to do, but you have to. Um, and then you might go home that evening. You might see the players use it on Instagram, and then you're like, oh, okay, well that wasn't so bad. <laughs> Um, and I presume then, as you kind of hinted then, Brennan, the flip side is that when you do catch the moment of the unbridled joy and someone just letting it all out after the greatest day of their lives, to be able to capture that moment and maybe at some point if that person has ever kind of been in contact with you to say, you know, that is just the moment that they'll, you know, it's the picture they'll be able to treasure forever. Yeah, like we, we're there to record the moments. Like if, a lot of times while there's, you know, again, there's lots of other media 
invariably people come back in life and they say, oh, do you remember this? And do you remember that? And when they look at a picture, they remember where they were, who they were with. So it invokes memories in them. Um, and again, like even the most reserved player, doesn't matter who it is, at the end of a big game or the end of a big final, they will let out a roar of joy. And it's really, it might only be for a split second, but that's what we're trying to capture. It's it's the golden moment, essentially. And yeah, two minutes later, there might be, oh, hang on now, I have to be reserved and I have to think of the next game and I have to be, you know, prim and proper and I have to speak this and I have to do that. But it's it's trying to catch the, the, the fleet moments. Like, while we take lots of pictures and we spend a lot of time doing what we do, the moments are like fractions of a second. Mm. Like there's, as I said, there's lots of sports pictures out there, but, you know, there's the top 1% as well and they're just fractions of a second and that's what that's what we go out every day to do is just to catch that it's great joy when when you do, like you do get a kind of a smile and a bit of smugness and going Jesus yeah you're that player like that picture and they message you and they go yeah geez I'd like that for my wall and you give them a print and whatever and and it's it's nice to be able to be appreciated that way because again people I think because of the advent of everybody takes pictures on phones nowadays, photography has lost an element of its appreciation um, because everybody thinks they can take pictures. But yeah. it's nice when you do get a subject kind of going, geez, that's a brilliant picture. I, I wouldn't have realized you'd be taking it. But it's when they see it then from our point of view where they see the picture and they go, Jesus, like, there's no way my family would have captured that on a phone. So, like, it's, it's, it's there for them forever and ever and ever. Yeah, it's a, I would say a very, very fulfilling moment when you kind of get the, the beautiful shot, when you kind of look back at it at the end of a day. Yeah, it would be, yeah. You'd, you'd, you'd have a bit of pride in it, in that that's ultimately what we're there for, as I said, to record the moments. And, and some of it is an element of history as well, in that while we do all our live stuff as well, you're also like a library. Like, we have a library going back. The Sports for Library itself goes back to the late 70s, early 80s, but we've pictures going back to the 50s. Mm. And when you kind of look at them and you kind of go, wow, look at, the, look at the way things were at the time, whether it's the hairstyles or the, the clothing or the game itself has changed. Like Stephen mentioned earlier, games have even changed so much, particularly in the last 10 or 15 years with the advent of like stats and strength and conditioning. Like the games have totally changed out of all recognition. Um, we might move on to the pictures that you've sent in to us now. So... You each sent me in a handful of photos each. I've picked out three of them. We're going to go through three for each of you. I'll start, Brendan, with the three that you sent me in. So this first one, um, I actually remember seeing this one before. Can you correct me in saying I think it did win an award? Um, so this is John McGrath and Hugh Lawler in the All-Ireland Hurling Final from last year. For those of you listening on the radio who obviously can't see this, we're streaming these at the moment on our YouTube channel and across all of our social media platforms. So if you do want to actually look at these photos, check out our video streams a little bit later on, or we'll also put a post up on offtheball.com as well so you can see this. So this moment, just to describe, is uh, John McGrath of Tipperary and Hugh Lawler of Kilkenny just coming in to tackle him. And John McGrath is trying to break out of this tackle He's got the arm out, the, the hurley in his right hand, slitter in the left. And it's just this perfect moment because you can actually see the condensation just flicking off both players as they collide together. So, Brendan, this was the first one that, um, that you sent in to us. Yeah, the, like, that was it, 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 the first half of the hurling final. I, it just poured out of the heavens. And I remember being there because I left my rain jacket inside in the press room. <laughs> so I was sitting there in a, in, a, in a short. But the game goes on. And, like, the, the spray is, is, is brilliant in the picture because, number one, it's, it's the perspiration of them. But, two, there's probably, I'd say it had just stopped raining. And so there's quite a lot of uh, rain on their helmets and everything mm. else. But it's, it's just one of these things that you hope to get in a game, a nice, clean picture. Like, obviously, John is just going full on. And Hughes is doing his best to stop. And then Hugh has just lost grip of his hurley. Um, it's just a fleeting moment. Like, there would have been a sequence of five or six frames of that. Um, but it's, it's, it was a nice picture. And it, it did win an award recently in America in uh, Pictures of the Year International, which is uh, run in America and gets, I think, like, there's 50,000 entries to it or something. Wow. But it was nice to win. Uh, thanks very much. It was, it, was, it was even interesting to hear the commentary from the judges in that, they initially thought it was field hockey and 
you know, because they wouldn't obviously be used to hurling. Yeah. But like as as we've we've spoken about earlier, hurling makes for great pictures. And like every day you go, to, yeah, if you're doing a hurling match, you're going, to, yeah, there's potentially is something in this where it mightn't happen with some other sports. You do kind of with the hurling and the fact that it's the All Ireland final and it's a big match and you know you do try and get your best pictures because a lot of the time at a hurling final the pictures get used the following day or the celebrations or the ejections the action doesn't always get used um, but I'd be very proud of this picture because it's just like I love shooting hurling and uh, when you get something like that it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, like as we were saying, hurling such a photogenic sport and this one sums it up completely. The next one uh, I've picked out that you sent on to us, this is it's a beautiful shot, a eh? horse is running on the beach. I'm going to guess, is this, is this Laytown Races? No, this is actually Belly Hike. Oh, right. Belly Hike down in County Kerry. Um, they have beach racing every every year around Christmas time and to an extent it was trying to get out of the house a little bit because I was down obviously with my family and, you know, a few days of Christmas, everybody wants to get out, get a bit of fresh air. Um, and I knew this was on. And, again, it varies from the time of the year because of the tides and whatnot. And I went along, and I look, I didn't really know if there'd be a picture in it, but it got me out of the house. I kind of maybe was getting a bit rusty after having not pick, taken any pictures for a week. Um, I actually think it was New Year's Eve. Um, so it made a couple of newspapers on, on New Year's Day the following day. But it was just, you know, it's sometimes the best pictures are not always at the big glamorous events. They can be taken anywhere. You just mm. have to be looking around all the time. Like anybody could have taken that picture. Yeah. It didn't have to be me and you don't need accreditation or you don't need whatever. Um, but it was just, it's a lovely picture for me because it, it's timeless in a way in that that could have, picture could have been taken at any time, you know, and that's what I love about it. And it's Kerry and it's the waves and, you know, there's just a nice kind of uh, calmness about it or something. Mm -hmm. And then the last one that I picked out, um, I'm wondering, is this a personal choice as well? Jurgen Klopp about to hoist the Champions League trophy last season. He's kind of got this this gurning facial expression. The trophy's ready to be hoisted and all the players gathering around him. And, I mean, he actually looks like he's going to, bur going to burst. Are you a Liverpool well, fan as well? Is this why this one came in also? I would be, yeah. <laughs> obviously, there's been a few tough years over the time. This was on assignment for UEFA. Um, and then we've been working for them for about 15 years. And the obvious picture out of the final would be Jordan Henderson, the captain, lifting the trophy. But this was like a split second later in that, you know, Klopp has been so involved in changing the fortunes of Liverpool the last couple of years. Um, you know, he, he's just so important to the club now. Um, and it was, first, like I'd been there the year before when Real Madrid beat them. And that was, on a, on a personal note, that was gutting. Uh, after what happened um, but then it was when they won last year it was it was nice to get a picture that I'd be you know like as I said we take loads of pictures at these events and sometimes you know things go your way sometimes they don't go your way and particularly it's such a momentous event it's nice to get a picture that you can kind of go I'd be proud of that picture and it would be a bit personal to me as well being a Liverpool fan having seen them uh, lift the, the European Cup for the first time since Istanbul so yeah it was pretty cool Right, Stephen, the three I picked out from you. First one, this is this is an unbelievable shot. This is from the roof of Croke Park. Uh, the five in a row celebrations when Dublin won last year. First of all, I imagine, very difficult for yourself to be capturing that moment as a proud Kerry man. And second of all, can you tell us the backstory of this? Because there are, you know, the fireworks are going off, the confetti is blowing all over Croke Park, and you're obviously on the roof of the stadium. Can you explain this one to us? Yeah, uh, I can, of course. Uh, well, the first thing is I'm not on the roof. Um, ah. it's, it's, uh, it's a picture, that's, it's, a, it's a camera that we installed on the, on the roof of, of the stadium uh, about three days before the final. Um, so over the last number of years, we've had access to the roof of the stadium. So it, most people can go to Crow Park and do a, the Skyline a tour. Well, there's another element to the roof of Crow Park, which nobody is generally allowed to go near um, unless you have the correct health and safety and all <laughs> that courses done. Uh, and I tell you, whatever you think about the skyline, this is this is a scary place to be uh, um, when, when the wind is blowing. Um, so it's actually the cameras installed in the lights of, of the stadium. Um, so we first had access, I think, to um, to the, the the roof about three or four years ago. Anyway, we generally only use it for semi-finals and finals. And every year we're trying to push, I suppose, our photography and our in, in innovation in sports while and we're trying to look at different pictures and different angles on on a stadium that the country knows so well. So like, is there an angle that nobody has seen here before? 
So we actually installed the camera in the same position three years ago, um, and it was for uh, for the hard, uh, football final. So it was the Dublin Mail game, and it it. It, it didn't quite work out. Uh, we, we were looking at it, and it's just like, okay, this is one to save for another day. So when it came to this year, uh, we thought this is the year. So we, it was an idea that's been actually in the back of our heads for about three years. The reason it works, uh, this picture is, is because it's it's it will only the picture only works when it's on a, at a replay, and all are in final replay because of the sunset in the oh, background. Yeah. So if this game is played on the third Sunday or in September, and it's a uh, whatever half two or three o'clock on a on a on a Sunday, you won't get it because the shadow actually cuts the stadium halfway, so uh, it doesn't work for you. You get a blown out sky and an exposed stadium. So when it's a Saturday evening later in September and you've got the sunset, it actually is the perfect picture for us uh, to do this to do this angle. So it's you have to be careful that you don't go and you rush this picture. You don't go and you do it every year because it doesn't work. So this was one we had in the back of our heads for three years. Uh, so the camera was installed on. Um, I think the Thursday uh, ahead of the the Saturday replay, um, and it's it's fired remotely. So if you zoom in really really closely uh, and go all the way down to the bottom, I'm actually in the bottom of the picture somewhere, uh, firing it at the same time. <laughs> but uh, like so that, that that camera sitting up there for for three days, but it actually only works for a split second. So it was trying to get the time up when the confetti was left off from the uh, the roof and when the fireworks went off. So. We were thankful the stadium were very good to work with us. The GA and Alan Milton were, were excellent to give us the permission to do it. And also Black Powder Monkey, who were the, the company that were doing all the fireworks uh, on the day. And they worked with us to, because it's, it's a tight space and a small space to install a camera. We had to, we worked closely with them to make sure we weren't in their way um, and that we weren't going to trigger off any fireworks prematurely. <laughs> yeah, it's a fantastic shot. The second one that we're bringing from you, this is my personal favourite now because I, I always talk about it. I... I'm a big rugby nut and I absolutely adore my scrums. And this one, uh, you actually got second place in the sports category at the World Press F Photo Foundation Awards for this. So this is from the 2017 Lions Tour. And it's, it's, in, a, you know, it's in portrait mode, so it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly long photo and quite narrow, but it is a scrum between the Lions and the New Zealand Maori and just the steam rising up into the, the darkest of night skies. Uh, it's just absolutely fantastic to look at. I personally have always found scrums to be the most photogenic things in the world because on those winter days, you always have those shots of the two packs coming together and the steam rising up off them. I've always thought they made for, uh, for fantastic photos. But yeah, like I'd say that was, that was a fantastic shot to get. Yeah, it was. It was, uh, it was it's one that'll probably... It'll uh, it'll last a lot longer than I will. I think people it, that, that's going into the archives uh, and it um, so the world a bit of background on, on the award itself was it's the World Press Photo Awards and in our uh, in our field is probably the biggest accolade we can get. Um, the, the only in photography the only thing bigger is probably a Pulitzer Prize and uh, I don't think sport will ever fall into that category <laughs> as much as we. Scrum, scrum certainly won't anyway. <laughs> they certainly won't. Um, and the thing with a scrum as well, that ninety percent, I suppose, you you actually don't see what's going on in there. You can't see mm. what's happening in those scrums. So, um, on, on the night it was uh, yeah, it was you said it, it was the uh, it was a midweek game and it was the New Zealand or the British Irish Lions against the Maori All Blacks. And it was a really, really cold, wet night in uh, in Rotorua, um, and it was one of those games that was like, it would just get through it because it was it was not an entertaining game. It was, it was a, it, it was nothing very clean in it. I think uh, the lines had two tries that day. One was a penalty try, and then Itoji uh, went over from close uh, to the line. So uh, as the game went on, you were just like, it, it was it wasn't producing great pictures, um, but at the same time. With the cold and the wet and the dampness, you knew there had to be a picture in the steam. So uh, as the game went on, you were watching for when the scrum would come together. Um, and whatever way, it just all came to uh, came into into place in the perfect place. Because the, the strange thing about it that people don't realize what it is, there's actually no branding whatsoever in the picture. Um, and like there's nothing done to the picture. The picture is as pure as, as it was taken. So in this day and age of overbranded sports and everything like that, it's, it's strange to see a, a picture with no branding in the background. Mm. Um, the, the, the floodlights um, gave the contrast to, to light up the, the, the steam coming from the bodies as they came into the scrum. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's one I'm incredibly proud of. Um, and you touched on it there as well. You said about it being in portrait mode. Um, it's, the picture was photographed upright. Um, and there was about four photographers in the same position. 
shooting the exact same thing. So we all saw the picture, but all four people shot it differently. Wow. Some people shot it wide and cropped it afterwards. Some people shot it tight and cut out the, the steam. And I think what, what stood for me is, um, and from the day I walked into sports world, I remember Ray McManus saying to me, he says, the camera goes both ways, turn it the other way around, turn it, turn it upright, is it compresses it. So if you shot that wide and cropped it in afterwards, you wouldn't have the compression and you wouldn't have had the impact that that uh, picture has. Um, and I suppose that's why uh, it, it stood out against so many other different variations of the same picture. And we're running out of time, just very quickly, the last one as well. This is... Uh, the celebrations of James McLean's goal against Wales in the uh, 2018 World Cup qualifier against Wales in Cardiff. I imagine this one falls into the category of you're in the right corner at the right time. Yeah, there is an element to that, but there's probably another bit to it as well, is that uh, like it was obviously a huge goal at the time. Um, and when James scored, he ran towards me, but he had actually ran towards me and ran past me. And I just felt this is such a huge goal that this celebration is going to go on for a long time. So I actually dropped whatever I had, picked up a wide angle uh, and a uh, lens and a camera and just ran around to the corner. And I knew this celebration was going to continue. So because the players ran from every corner of the pitch, it actually lasted much longer. So it gave me the time to get that extra picture out of it. And I think you touch on how players not showing emotion um, are not uh, are kind of being very conservative maybe in their emotions earlier on. The one thing that stands out from, uh, from this picture is Harry Archer's reaction. Mm. Harry Archer is the most reserved footballer I've probably ever photographed. I've never seen him react or showing any emotion, but that goal means so much. Uh, and you just see what it means to him. And they're all, they ran and celebrated towards the fans. And I suppose that was, the, the buzz off of that was incredible. We thought, here, this is it. This What could have what could be? Like, we're, we're into the playoffs. Unfortunately, that didn't end so well, and that was probably the height of our celebrations. Unfortunately not. Uh, so for those who want to actually see those pictures back, as I say, go to our YouTube channel, at Off The Ball, and you can watch this video back, and uh, we have those pictures up on screen. Guys, thanks a million for joining us this afternoon on the Saturday panel. I'm just going to leave you go with two texts that have come in. Uh, the first one is... One standout sports wild photo for me is the 2010 Leinster Senior Football Championship final. One of the umpires at the canal end looking at Joe Sheridan as he has the ball in his hands just before he threw it into the net. Uh, Michael, a member of Angarda Siakana, regularly on duty at Croke Park, uh, who said that in Ray and his colleagues are dead sound is what he says. And the last one, this is a lovely text to get. Um, a nice way to finish things off. Just want to thank Sports File. You took a picture of my brother and his son in 2009. It was a Division 3 hurling league game just after full time. My brother passed away in 2015 tragically, but it's my favourite picture of him. That's from John in Sligo when he says, you don't just cover the big days. That's no, a lovely uh, way to finish it, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, the memories, yeah, I suppose. Nice yeah, that's good. That's lovely. So yeah, mm -hmm. a lovely text from uh, John in Sligo to finish things off. Brendan and Stephen, thanks a million for joining us this afternoon on the Saturday panel. Uh, for those of you who have missed out on this and want to hear it back, we'll be podcasting it on offtheball.com a little bit later on. Uh, but we'll be back after the break. Off the Ball on News Talk. Screen Time with John Farty. Here's Johnny. That's a bad impression and a reference to a movie all about someone who's feeling isolated. And this week on